Morning everybody. Welcome to the Linux kernel hidden inside Windows 10. This is Mandalay Bay EF in case you're in the wrong room. Um, has, have the pleasure of introducing Alex Ionesco. Uh, before we begin, a, a little housekeeping. Please stop by the business hall located in Bayside AB during the day and for the welcome reception from 1730 to 1900 tonight. Uh, the Black Hall Arsenal is on the Palm Foyer on level 3. Join us for the Pony Awards as well in Mandalay Bay BCD at 1830. Also, as usual, please put your phones on vibrate. We don't like to hear your phone ringing. Thanks, Alex. Good luck. Thank you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Um, so, welcome to um, the Linux kernel hidden inside Windows 10. A little brief uh, by myself. Currently, VP EDR Strategy at CrowdStrike, um, security startup, as probably some of you know. Um, worked at Apple before that on the core platform team, um, helping get iOS ported basically from OS 10. And most, most of you probably know me as is the co-author of the Windows Internals book series, um, which I'm happy to say, by the way, finally has a seventh edition that someone will be publishing. So for those of you who are waiting for that, um, apparently it's going to happen. So most of my knowledge in Windows comes from what I've been doing for the last uh, 15 years, which is just reversing Windows um, with you know, IDA and other tools before that. I was main developer of React OS, so an open source implementation of Windows. And this has pretty much been my passion ever since, taking apart Windows and looking at um, what's inside it and what's, uh, what's hiding under the hood. And as every new version of Windows comes out, what other new things are hiding under the hood. Um, and obviously, as the talk title suggests, there's a pretty interesting thing hiding under the hood this time. Um, so we'll see kind of how all that works. Um, one little caveat, I guess. Um, someone posted out there. They're actually spoiler alert. There isn't any Windows uh, Linux kernel in the Windows in the Windows kernel. So I guess I was wrong. All my research was uh, incorrect. So you can go. Uh, apparently, there's there's nothing there. But if you think there is, I, you maybe want to stick around and we'll see what's actually in there. So um, basically, we're going to talk about some anti-kernel concepts, minimal and pico processes. Quickly talk about what exactly is a minimal process and what's a pico process. And then how do you become a Pico provider for a Pico process? Very quick kind of intro with some NT there. And then we're actually going to talk about the Linux subsystem. The Linux subsystem has a few components, which I'll talk about, one of which is LX Core, which is going to be the kernel mode driver, and the other one's LXSS Manager, which is the actual service. So we'll talk about some of the functionality, some of the interfaces that the driver and the service has, as well as some attack surfaces that exist inside of it. LXSS, the Linux subsystem, also has an interesting IPC mechanism. Um, it's not exposed. I mean, not, none of this is really exposed. But we'll talk about kind of how, whoops, Windows processes and Linux processes can actually talk to each other. That's a good warning. Just turn that on. All right. Um, so we'll see how Windows and Linux processes can talk to each other and how Microsoft kind of implemented that functionality. And then we'll actually talk about um, probably what most of you are here for, the security design considerations of all this. So first of all, when I first um, encountered the Linux subsystem many, um, many months ago, almost more than a year ago now, there were a number of things that were very scary about it. Um, and I got the chance to approach Microsoft about it and kind of work um, with them, giving us some ideas on how they can improve things. And happy to report most of the issues have been fixed by now. But there are some important kind of environmental things you need to be aware of. As a sysadmin, um, as a developer of endpoint security products, we're going to see there's some very interesting things about um, these processes and, and kind of how they exist in the environment that they run in. Um, if we have time, I'll talk about some very brief forensics you can do, like for example, how you can use the debug viewer to see some of the internals, how you can use WinBack to see some of the internals. Um, and hopefully we'll get a chance to show a few demos. I've got a demo of just kind of a, a, a nice thing, of just how you can build Linux apps with Visual Studio with the subsystem, which is just kind of for fun. Um, but a more kind of interesting demo is I've actually built a uh, Linux application and a Windows client that talk to each other using the undocumented IPC mechanisms. So you can kind of just see how that works. Um, and also how you can launch a Linux app without using the, the bash environment that it give you. Which obviously is interesting because, you know, it means that if we had an O-Day today in Windows 10 anniversary update, um, you could instead of popping calc, you might be able to, you know, pop a bash prompt. And that'd be pretty funny, right? So uh, we'll do a, a few demos there and then I'll conclude and, um, have time for questions. If there isn't any time for questions, because I've gone over like I almost always do, uh, since there's a coffee break, I'll be, I'll be around and you can ask me questions um, throughout the conference and you can just harangle me when you find me. All right. So let's get started talking a little bit about this idea of a Pico process and of a minimal process. So the idea of a minimal process actually showed up in Windows 
um, it wasn't clear what it was going to be used for at that time. You have to remember that uh, a lot of this stuff we're seeing obviously was built over years and little pieces of it kind of leaked out over time. But a minimal process is essentially a Windows process that has no address space created by default. So there's no PEB, which is standard thing all Windows apps have. There's no anti-DLL, which is a standard DLL all Windows applications must have. There's no uh, key user shared data, which is another structure everyone has to have. Um, there's no handle table either. So they're very kind of bizarre processes, like the name implies, minimal, they don't have the things you would expect to find. And the only way you can kind of tell that a process is minimal, obviously other than everything's missing, is there's a flag in the process um, called minimal, that's such a true. Now as you create threads inside these minimal processes, the threads have no tab, they have no stack that gets created, and they don't have the standard using of context that gets created either. Um, and again, there's no real way to tell them apart other than, again, they have a flag called minimal set to true themselves. So how do you get these minimal processes? Well, in Redstone 1, which is, was the code name for the anniversary build of Windows that came out yesterday, um, there's the anti create process ex function lets you pass a flag to create minimal processes. But it's only exposed for kernel mode. So from user mode, you can't create minimal processes, at least not today. Um, but in the new Windows 10 build, if you look at Task Manager, for example, you're going to see a process called memory compression, which implements some of the new memory compression technology they've had in Windows 10. That's a minimal process. You're going to see something called Secure System, if you enable uh, virtualization based security, which I talked about at Black Hat last year. Um, that again is a minimal process. So they're basically these empty processes with nothing in them, but they still have threads that get scheduled. They still have memory, um, and they can still execute stuff inside, but just kind of not your usual user mode environment. On top of these minimal processes, you then have Pico processes. And what a Pico process is, is a minimal process that has a Pico provider. And essentially what makes them Pico processes versus just minimal processes is there's a flag or a pointer called Pico context, and Pico context not being null implies this is a Pico process. And then threads inside a Pico process become Pico threads. So what does it mean to be a Pico process or a Pico thread? Well, for example, if you make a system call, you're going to be rerouted to Pico provider. If someone wants a stack trace, it gets rerouted to the Pico provider. If you get an exception or a page fault, it gets rerouted to a Pico provider. If someone wants to know what the name of the process is, you guessed it, rerouted to Pico provider. If someone tries to open a handle to this process to the thread, Pico provider says yes or no. And finally, when a, process, a Pico process dies or a Pico thread dies, once again, the Pico provider is notified. So basically all these kind of essential execution aspects of a thread get subsumed by a Pico provider instead of by the normal native uh, functionality that the Windows kernel provides. So you're not doing NT system calls, you're not having NT exceptions anymore, you're not having NT stacks, whatever the Pico provider is providing is what these processes end up seeing. So basically Pico providers are custom kernel mode drivers that allow you to implement callbacks so that you can then kind of host a Pico process and provide all the functionality that's going to need. And this is basically the implementation of a Microsoft research project that went on for many, many years called Drawbridge. And so that project, you know, matured from a research project to a productized implementation in the anniversary update. And so the kernel exposes a function, PS register Pico provider, and now you can register Pico provider by providing the callbacks that are, the kernel's gonna call, and then you get some callbacks as well so that you can now create Pico processes, create Pico threads, et cetera. However, the key is this API will only work if this flag, PSP Pico registration disabled, is set to false. So if it's set to true, then you cannot register a Pico provider. And before loading any third party drivers whatsoever, whether you're an ELAM driver or a bootstar driver, that variable is already set to true. So the only thing that can call the API early enough is a Microsoft built in driver. And so right now there's only one of those and there's only one Pico provider. And of course, you guess that it's going to be the Linux driver that actually uses this functionality. Now, once you're a Pico provider, you get access to some APIs. So there's some things you can do on a system. For example, you can create Pico processes and threads. You can um, get a, associate and get a Pico context associated with these things. You can define the starting CPU context of these things. You can suspend them and resume them. You can kill them, obviously, and you can also configure their FS and GS segments. So basically, this lets you create and control um, these types of processes which you then essentially manage. So this is a very nice diagram that actually Microsoft published on, on their blog, so you know, copyright and kudos to them. And basically what you see here is an anti process is just a normal Windows process with all the anti things you're probably familiar with. A minimal process has none of that inside it, 
And then a Pico process is basically a minimal process which has nothing inside it either, but has a Pico provider taking care of all its exceptions, all of its system calls, and everything else. So it's an extension of the idea of a minimal process. So that's basically the internal kind of functionality that makes all this work. Now, you might be wondering, um, can someone register their own Pico provider? Can someone hook Pico providers? Because obviously, if these things can hook all the system calls and do everything they want, uh, what prevents a bad guy from doing that as well? So Pico providers actually register with PatchGuard, which is the Microsoft anti-hooking technology in the kernel. So PatchGuard will actually protect the Pico provider, will actually protect the system calls inside the Pico provider as well. So in the Linux case, it means that all of Linux's system calls are actually going to be protected by PatchGuard, which is pretty cool. Uh, now, if you try to register a fake provider, PatchGuard will catch you. If you try to patch that uh, Boolean that says, oh, no, no, registrations are enabled now, PatchGuard will crash you. If you turn the Boolean on and then turn it off, PatchGuard will crash you. And if you try to actually hook the Pico provider callbacks that the kernel saves, those are protected by PatchGuard as well. So there's a lot of kind of security marks I put here to make sure no one is showing up with their own Pico provider to basically, you know, hook your applications and do bad things to them. Um, so people have to find ways around the PatchGuard implementation if they want to do that. So how does this fit into the kind of the Windows subsystem for Linux, the WSL component, or I like to call it the Linux subsystem? Well, basically you have a Pico provider driver. Um, it's instantiated by lxss.sys, but it's actual, the actual provider is lxcore.sys, so linuxcore.sys. And that's really what provides the kernel mode implementation of a Linux compatible kernel ABI and API. So there is no Linux, there isn't the Linux kernel. There's no GPL code here. Um, there's all, it's basically a Linux compatible ABI and API. So all the system calls are there, the environment is there, but there's no code that was shared within the Linux foundation or, you know, the GPL or anything like that. It's completely clean. And it also provides a Windows interface to manage um, these Windows subsystem Linux instances. So it has a device object, device LXSS, and that allows basically command and control of the driver and various things you can, uh, you can do to it. It also provides a bus idea. And the bus is basically what allows the Windows subsystem for Linux instances to communicate with the NT world. Um, the driver also implements VFS, so you get the full virtual file system implementation that Linux has. You get inodes, um, and there's even a device inode on the Linux side to talk to this. So the Windows side can open slash device slash LXSS, which is the NT name, and then there's, a, we're going to see later, there's a slash dev inode, which Linux can use, which is a Linux name. In user mode, you then have a management service, LXSS Manager, and this then provides a COM interface around the driver. So you don't talk to the driver directly, you use COM over RPC to talk to the Linux Substance Manager, and then it uses um, IOCTLs and ERPs to talk to the driver. Now, what is this running in user mode in the Linux environment? Obviously, if you have Linux, you need all your Linux binaries. You need bash, you need, you know, grep, you need wget, where are all those coming from? You essentially get a user mode Ubuntu 14 environment. So when you first install this, you get the ISO from Ubuntu directly, and the, it just lays down a file system with all the standard binaries you can have in an Ubuntu 14 distribution. The key thing is that Ubuntu, though, has an upstart or systemd process, right? That's your init daemon um, on most Linux systems. Well, Microsoft had to write one custom piece of, of code here, which is their own init daemon. So everything else on this file system is basically directly from Ubuntu, unmodified, but there's a custom init daemon, which we're going to see actually kind of makes it all work, because that init daemon needs to know it's not really running under the Linux kernel, but it's running under kind of a, a wrapper or a compatible Windows implementation of that kernel. You then have two simple processes, lxrun.exe, which is how you install, uninstall, update, and service the subsystem, and you have a launcher service, which is essentially um, bash.exe. And then bash.exe spawns instances of bash or other things, as we're going to see by talking to the lxss manager, and lxrun will also talk about how it kind of provides all that management um, and installation. So we're going to go over these components in a little bit more detail. Um, that being said, that's kind of a, the big scary picture which no one will be able to read uh, right now on the slides, which will be posted online, um, obviously. So that's basically kind of how the whole system works, um, and we'll go and talk about some of these components. Again, this is tiny, I know. When you get the slides, it'll, um, it'll, it'll look a bit, a bit better. But, you know, just architectural show off. All right, so let's talk about the LX core side, and then kind of go a little bit deeper into how it, how it functions. So first of all, it's a driver, right? It runs in kernel mode, so it's ring zero. It's about 800 kilobytes. So it's a very large piece of ring zero code, obviously re-implementing the entire kernel ABI here. Um, now in some cases, the implementations of the Linux API are written from scratch. So for example, the pipe implementation, 
is a from scratch implementation of Linux pipes. Uh, in other cases, we're just kind of wrapping something that the NT-Kernel already provides. For example, scheduling. Uh, there isn't a custom scheduler that's like a Linux-specific scheduler in any way. You basically just wrap all scheduler APIs to the NT-scheduler, and the NT-scheduler takes care of all, all that's work. In other cases, you get a mix. For example, the file system. Well, the file system is still NTFS. This still installs an NTFS kind of directory and, and lays out the, the files on your machine. But on top of NTFS, they build VFS, they've built the idea of inodes, they've built the VFS style caching of inodes and directory entries, um, and they've built, you know, uh, tempfs and other emulated things. And so sometimes you get a mix, um, just like in a networking scenario as well, where ultimately the networking is done by the Windows TCP IP stack, but there's a whole BSD socket emulation layer or wrapper layer on top of that. And basically when they did one or the other, essentially it had to do with compatibility. For example, NT pipes, you know, NT has the name pipe file system, MPFS. NT pipes have uh, slight differences from Linux pipes. So if you just took Linux pipes and implemented them on top of MPFS, things wouldn't be that compatible. So they had to do that from scratch. Meanwhile, scheduling, well, the scheduling algorithms are highly internal to OSs anyway. Linux changes theirs, you know, every, every major build. Um, so things aren't that dependent on, on the scheduler. In other cases, they had to do things that were close enough. Like, they didn't want to write, you know, full support for real XFS, um, you know, with real inodes on top of that. So instead they took NTFS, and they kind of put VFS on top of it um, using things like alternate direct uh, data streams or extended attributes, and it works close enough. Like, there are some issues with, like, case sensitivity and symlinks pointing to the wrong partition and weird things like that, but it's close enough for now, and they'll keep kind of improving on it. And it's also important to remember that NT originally had a POSIX subsystem. So the idea of case sensitivity the idea of um, devices that aren't just drive letters, um, the, the fact that there were extended attributes in ADS and NTFS, a lot of the original design decisions done by you know, Dave Cutler and his team back in the 80s and 90s paid off to basically make this work. Because if Windows, the Windows kernel was not case sensitive, it would have been a lot harder to kind of bring this, um, bring this into light today. You can also customize the driver a little bit. So there's some registry keys, this is mostly for reference, um, that allow you to set up some tracing and some additional features uh, of the subsystem. This is probably intended for testing, but it's useful for forensics as well, so um, you'll have this on the slide um, when, once these are released. So obviously one of the most important things that the subsystem can do is provide the system call interface that Linux applications are gonna need. Now Microsoft actually has the full official list on their release notes page, um, so it'll actually be listed in every build what, what system calls they added, which is pretty nice of them to do. Um, so today, you know, as of the release build which came out yesterday, there's 216 system calls, Linux system calls. They're implemented by LXP Sys Dispatch. Um, there's support for pre-trace, which is really nice. You can enable uh, certain debugging features, like have a breakpoint of a system call fail fails, and you can also enable system call tracing, and if we have time I'll show you that, where you basically set up a few variables in the kernel or in the registry, and then in the bug view you can see every single system call that's being made, um, which is, you know, really good. It's kind of like having a progmon for the Linux world. Um, it's just traces, but it's better than nothing. So that's kind of one interface that it has. The other interface that it has, of course, is the file system, or VFS. So there's two main kind of file system groups that they implement. One of them is called volfs, and this is basically your Linux-facing partition. This is where you have support for Unix writes, you can chmod, uh, chown, and this uses a lot of the NTFS alternate data stream support and extended attribute support to basically emulate or wrap some of the Linux file system specific things on top of NTFS. And so because of that, this file system or this directory um, on your file system isn't compatible with Win32. If you drag a Win32 file in there from Explorer, it's not going to have the right attributes, it's not going to have the right data streams, so the Linux subsystem's not going to understand what to do with this. So there's a second file system model called DriveFS, or DRVFS, and this actually is the Linux-facing system that implements or maps your Win32 drives. So by using Linux mount points, they actually mount your C drive, your D drive, whatever external USB drives you have, they mount them in the Linux world, and then you can actually interoperate with the files you have there. So you're not supposed to kind of touch the Linux side of things, but if you've got your own files, the Linux subsystem can read from them and vice versa. So this is a real, you know, one of the things that I often get asked is this is, you know, all running on your host. It all has access to your file system. So there's no kind of emulation or VM around here. Uh, it's a real file system that, that, that it can access. And then on top of this, they also implement things like a procfs, obviously. So you actually can go in, you know, cat slash proc slash the PID 
and this will call the appropriate kernel APIs. Um, there's tempfs, of course, which provides like the slash dev, so you have actual devices that they implement. Now, they don't implement real device drivers in this environment, right? So you don't have access to your webcam, for example. You don't have access to your, your printer. You don't have access to uh, USB or PCI devices other than the network, um, obviously the mouse and the keyboard, you know, so you have your input and output, but you don't have custom device drivers that you can talk to or that are mapped in any way, which is a good thing because the last thing you want is, you know, Windows drivers suddenly talking to Linux processes. And there's SysFS as there, of course. So the file system obviously is a big piece and another kind of attack surface behind this. Um, and Microsoft, again, on their blog, has a really good uh, picture that he put up, which basically kind of shows you, you know, there's your Linux application, there's LX Core, all the system calls that are implemented by the system call layer go down to VFS, and then there's your VOLFS, which is, again, your Linux environment, your DRVFS, which is your Windows mount points, and then tempfs, procfs, sysfs, etc. All this then built on top of the anti-kernels, object manager, IO manager, and NTFS. So ultimately, the, the reason and writes are still done by the anti-kernel when all this is set and done. So when this thing basically starts up, it's got a little um, LX score initialized function and basically registers itself as a Pico provider, sets up some event log tracing. So actually this is fully kind of plugged into the event log. And if you're familiar with ETW, you can enable it and see everything that it's doing. Um, and then it just basically works, waits for ERPs. So it waits for IO uh, request packets from user mode. So someone can come in and request the create, close, and clean up to basically create instances or entities of the subsystem. Um, there's IOCTL, so device control to actually configure and, and set state and talk to the subsystem. And then there's read and writes, which are used by the IPC mechanism. So when this thing starts up, it creates this slash device slash LXSS device object. Now, on top of this device object, you have five different interfaces. You have a root bus interface, and this is how the Linux manager service creates new instances. Once you have an instance, you then get a device or file object for the bus instance interface. And every instance has a GUID, and so you now have a file object inside of this namespace to talk to specifically to that instance. And what's an instance is basically just a, se a, sesh a Linux session. So it's your init daemon, and then anything you create under that, under your kind of account token. Then you can obtain a client interface to the instance. So the instance can have multiple clients talking to it, and these clients can then basically set up IPC among themselves. So as the clients set up IPC, they're creating IPC server ports and IPC message ports. Um, the model is very similar to ALPC, if you're familiar with that, or RPC in user mode. Uh, it's all custom and internal, but it's basically how instances can talk to Win32, and we'll see how the subsystem actually uses that internally. So the root bus basically has a single IOCTL that the Linux uh, manager calls, IOCTL, ADSS, control, whatever, and this basically sets up an instance, um, and it creates the GUID, it mounts the file systems, it creates the job object, the, it passes the token, tells us what to map inside the mount points, and basically just defines what the instance is gonna look like. Nothing starts yet. Once the instance is actually being created, then you get a handle to the instance, and then there's an octal there, set instance state, and the LXSS manager service starts the instance. Um, obviously, you can then update the network path, up, update the network cards, or map any paths that it needs, but once it starts the instance, then the init daemon actually starts up. So then you get init, and you're gonna see init and you know, process hacker or task manager, and then whatever um, is the process you wanna launch after that, we're gonna see um, it get la gets launched. So initially an instance is just an instance of, uh, of init, and then something's gonna have to go and talk to that. Now, once an instance is created, you can have bus clients. So clients, again, are things that are talking to the instance, and a client can register a server, a client can also connect to a server. So the server side of a client, a client that's a server will basically register a server. A client that's a client of that server will, will connect to it. Um, there's some other things which I did not look at. I don't know if they actually used uh, enlightened forks and Faustin callbacks. So I don't actually, I have no idea what these things are actually used for. Um, I spent a long time reversing this, but I couldn't really see anything using those. So they may be things for the future. Now once a, uh, Instance is created, in the Linux world, you get a slash dev LXSS. So this is something you can actually see in Bash. Um, and this is basically how a Linux process can talk to the instance and become a client of it. And the idea here is on the Windows side, someone can use the Windows IOCTL interface to register a service. On the Pico side, on the Linux side, someone can use the Linux device instance to connect to that service. And as we're going to see in the APC section, now you can have a Pico process or Linux process and a Windows process talking to each other. The key thing is that 
only the init daemon is actually allowed to talk to that. Um, now there's a registry key I'm gonna show you later which lets you bypass that, but by default only init can actually talk to this instance and talk to the Windows world. Um, but there's, there, there are ways around that. So then the server's a mess, the server and message ports are basically how uh, a Pico or Linux process and a Windows process can talk to each other's. And it allows two things. It allows raw data to be sent through read and write calls and it allows marshalling and demarshalling as well. So there's some things you can marshal, there's some things you can demarshal, um, and I'll show you uh, what, what those are. And then you can also associate events and you can map memory as well. So one side can map memory and the other side can map that other process memory. So you can have uh, memory mappings between the Linux world and the Windows world. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in the IPC section. So that's kind of what the kernel um, driver provides. And now take a look at some of the user side behind all of this. So LXSS Manager is the thing that provides the user mode service. And LXSS Manager is essentially a service that is in a service host. So it's gonna be one of those SVC host.exe processes. And inside of it is gonna have a DLL which is gonna be LXSS Manager. Now it runs as a protected process light or PPL at the Windows level. So if you're not familiar with PPLs, I've given talks on this or you can read the blog or MSDN. Uh, but essentially it's a very protected, as the name suggests, process that no one can really touch. And we're gonna see in the security section why they made it a PPL. It then registers a COM class, um, LXSS user session, which then implements an interface called ILXSS session. So over COM, things can now talk to the um, LXSS manager. Now it has, one single interface, which is LXSS session. And with that interface, you can ask it to start a new instance, to get a, the current instance ID, to change the state of an instance, to get the state of an instance, or to initialize the file system for the first time when you first kind of install the thing and, and, and laid it down. Once you either get an instance or start an instance, you then get an ILX, ILXSS instance com object, which you can then use to configure the instance, query and send information on the instance, um, register a server that is gonna use the IPC mechanism we're gonna see, or connect to a server so the Linux side can actually have a server of its own that you connect to, and most importantly perhaps, the ability to create a Linux process inside of this instance. So you can request the instance to actually create a process, and we're gonna see what, what's actually gonna do that work. Now some of these COM objects and requests can be done from anyone. Like for example, if you call create LX process, you don't have to be admin to do that. What's gonna happen is you're gonna get a Linux process that is gonna have the same token as your user account. So if you're Alex and you create a Linux process, you're gonna get an Alex Pico process from the, from the kernel's point of view. The other things, like for example, registering a bus server, that you actually have to be admin for. So the com calls are gonna check um, your token and whether or not they allow you to do that. Who actually talks to this manager officially? It's not documented, so you shouldn't be just grabbing com objects to this like I have. Two things, lxrun.exe and bash.exe. So these are the two Windows binaries that you get on the machine which allow you to talk to the Linux manager and then the Linux manager will then talk to the driver. So what do lxrun and bash do? lxrun is essentially what lets you create users in the Linux environment, it lets you install and uninstall the Linux environment, and it lets you service it and update it. All of this is done through command line options. So you can run lxrun slash install, LX run slash uninstall, LX uh, run slash set default user, etc. And internally, this basically has some classes that help it do that. The ironic thing here, the thing that makes sense, I guess, maybe not ironic, but I thought it was cute, is that all these actions ultimately then launch Linux processes. So, like if you call LX run set default user, this basically launches uh, user mod, ID, pass, the, pass the w, add group, del user, and add user. So, it actually calls the Linux Pico uh, binaries launches them in an invisible instance to actually do that work. Um, similarly, if you actually do an, an update, well, what update actually does is it spins up an instance and just calls apt, and then it does an apt get updates for you. So this actually just launches the Linux apps behind your back. Um, so you could actually have just yourself launched bash and done an apt, you know, an apt, an apt update if you wanted to, but you know, Windows users might not know how to update an Ubuntu environment, so LX run basically acts as a bridge between what you know, Windows admin might know how to do and what, might, what they might not know a Linux process requires. And then finally, bash, that's essentially your launcher. It has a single kind of function inside of it and it uses that create LX process to let you launch anything you want. Now, normally when you launch bash, it looks like all it does is launch the bash prompt, but if you actually do bash-c, for example, 
and type another command in quotes, it's actually going to run that command. Just like in a real Linux system, if you use bash dash c, it launches that other binary. Um, what's interesting here though is that you're not going to get bash, which then will process the argument and then launch man. The bash.exe itself will understand what this means and it'll just launch man directly. So if you use bash.exe dash c, it creates the instance and launches whatever the kind of binary you put in there. So it doesn't actually, it's not going to be rooted through bash versus in a real Linux system, if you use bash dash c, you know, bash is actually a thing that processes that and then it launches the, the sub process. So, um, very simple thing here is just a launcher and it just reads your registry to basically figure out what token should it use, not, sorry, not what token, but what, uh, what Linux user it should use. So if I'm Alex and I've defined a Linux user called Bob, when I launch bash, it's going to say Bob in the Linux environment because that's what I've configured it to. So it basically knows the UID and the GID that at installation time I configured and then I can use LX run to configure additional users and, you know, use standard commands in Linux to switch between the users and so on and so forth. So those are the Windows facing side of things. That's how you can kind of launch a prompt, uh, talk to it, and that's who it talks to and that's the driver that it talks to. But the key missing piece here is that there's something needed on the Linux side too. Because if I send a create bash request to the LXSS manager, how does the Linux manager in the Windows world know how to create a bash process in the Linux world. So what you then need is the inner daemon. So an inner daemon starts up whenever the instance gets started um, and basically has a very simple initialization function called init entry. It closes every handle from 0 to 2048, kind of a weird defense mechanism. Um, it opens slash dev slash k message. So if you're a Linux person, or almost any OS uh, person that's not Windows, you probably know what that is. So that's your kernel log. And it duplicates that as in standard error. So any errors are basically going to go in K message. Um, and then it makes standard in and standard out be slash dev null. So it doesn't have any standard in or standard out. And then it opens the handle slash dev slash LXSS. So it becomes a bus client of its own instance. Um, then creates a symlink for resolve.conf. And then it tries to connect to a server and it tries to connect to an IPC server called LXSS Manager. And that's what the LXSS Manager on the Windows side has created as an IPC server on the Linux side using the bus driver, the Linux driver that exists. It basically creates a listening server that can now receive, um, that can now send commands, sorry, to the uh, init process and also receive responses from the init process. And then basically it sets up some signal handlers and then it sits in a loop and it just calls read message from server. So it's just waiting for messages from um, LXSS Manager. Now what can LXSS manage Manager ask it to do? Very simple things. It can ask it to update the network information. So there's an API in it update network info and essentially this will update etcresolve.conf. You can update the time zone information and basically this creates a symlink and sets up user share zone info Microsoft local time. If you update your host name, this then will call set host name, it will call set domain name, and it's going to update etc host name and create an etc host file for you. So kind of these first three things make sure that the instance is up to date to Windows changes. So if you change the time zone in Windows, it changes in Linux. If you add a host name or change the host name in Windows, it happens on the Linux side as well. Uh, so this kind of keeps state synchronization between the Windows world and the Linux world. And then perhaps the most important thing it does is provide an API to create a process. So basically over that IPC channel, LXSS Manager can talk to the Linux process and ask it, please create a new process. And it's going to pass to the environment variables, it's going to pass to the command line, the working directory, the standard handles, and then in it we'll call fork. After fork returns, you get a PID back, and then it's going to set up the UID, the GID, the environment variables for the home and the path, set up the, the session, the console session, duplicate any handles that it needs, and then call exec VPE and actually exec, right? So it's a standard fork exec, just like you would do in the Linux process, and then init now forks execs bash usually, unless you've told it to launch something else in instead. Um, and there's also support for what's called creating a session leader, so init can also fork more inits if you have kind of multiple users logged in at the same time and they all have their own bash environments, obviously we, we want to separate them. So this custom init process is what actually is going to be the proxy in a way that's going to create all the processes that you're going to launch with bash.exe or with LX run as needed. So let's talk a little bit deeper about that IPC mechanism, how exactly a Windows app can talk to a Linux app um, or vice versa. Um, 
Now, of course, since you've got sockets and files in this environment, this is kind of the standard documented way. You can use Unix sockets to have Unix applications talk to each other. But if you want to talk to Windows, very simply, you have sockets. You can set up a server on localhost. On the Windows side, you connect to the localhost service, and then these things can actually talk to each other. Uh, similarly, since the file system is mapped and mounted, you can create a file on the Windows side, read it on the Linux side, write back into it on the Linux side, and read the answer on the Windows side. So sockets and files work, um, but that's not the internal IPC mechanism they use. You know, this is kind of the external model that exists. And as a developer, this is what you're supposed to use. Internally, though, the more interesting IPC is this bus IPC model, which for legacy reasons is still called ADSS IPC, um, which came from the name Android Subsystem. And I'll share a little bit later uh, kind of where that name came from and why it says Android in there. So basically, this allows you to create a named server, register it, have someone connect to that named server, and then basically you can use read and write calls on the Linux side or on the Windows side to basically send and receive messages. Or you can use IOCTLs on the Windows side or on the Linux side to marshal and unmarshal certain kinds of data. Now on the Windows side to register a server, you need to send an IOCTL. And only the Linux manager service can send this IOCTL. So it's normally locked down. However, the COM interface that it creates has a method called register ADSS bus server. And if you're admin, you can register a bus server. Once you register the bus server, you actually get back in your process a handle to the server port, and then you can start sending IOCTLs on the server port. So for example, you can send wait for connection, and now you're gonna block waiting for Linux process to connect to you. The Linux side would then open slash dev LXSS. They have to be root in order to be able to do that. Then you can send an IOCTL to connect to you. And now by using read and writes, the Linux side has a file descriptor. On the Windows side, you have a file handle, and you can talk to each other. The key is that right now, by default, only the init daemon can actually talk to a Windows process. So opening slash dev LXSS is only allowed if you're init, if your PID is one. However, if you go into registry, there's a parameter key called root ADSS bus access. And if you set that to one, then anyone who's root in the Linux environment can use this IPC mechanism as well. And of course, then it gets interesting because you can have custom Linux apps, which once this change has been done in your registry, can talk to custom Windows apps. So, so there's also marshalling. So what can you marshal and unmarshal? You can take a PID on the Linux side, marshal it, and the Windows side will get a process handle, right? Because ultimately Linux PID is gonna be a Pico process. So if the Windows side wants to have a handle to the Pico process, it can be marshaled as a PID. You can marshal console handles. So console handles are how when you launch bash.exe, you get a Windows console, but then the actual bash Linux app has a standard in and standard out. That's a marshaled console handle. You can marshal pipe handles as well. And this is actually really interesting, and I've tried it out. Basically, let's you create a pipe on the Windows side that shows up as a file descriptor on the Linux side, and then by using pipe APIs on Windows and using read and write on Linux, you can actually just do standard pipes. Um, so this actually allows piping from Windows to Linux, but they don't actually expose this. Like today, if you run bash and you pipe it with something else, it, it won't actually pipe. But obviously, the implementation is, is, is in there. And finally, you can also marshal tokens. So a Windows app can create a token or get an anonymous token and then send it uh, to the other side. And when it gets unmarshaled, when that process then forks, it's gonna fork with the new token. And there's some interesting things there that uh, James Forshaw is gonna be honest. I'm sure he'll, he'll, look, at, he'll look into that. So there's some myoctyls um, to kind of do that kind of marshal and unmarshaling. You also get some data exchange APIs. So the data exchange APIs, one side, can create or register a shared memory section, and the other side can see it. One side, the Windows side, can create an event object that the other side can signal, or the Linux side can have an event object that gets signaled and then the Windows side wakes up. So you can use ePoll or select or wait for single object um, to then kind of do data exchange beyond just um, messages. And a Linux app can actually share part of its address space with an NT app, and then the NT app can map it. So you can't do vice versa yet. I'm sure they kind of thought about why that might be a bad idea. But a Linux app can essentially make the whole address space that it has visible to a Windows app, and then Windows app can map it and, and modify it um, for read-write access only. So thankfully, there's no way to do that with execute access unless you know, there's, there's a flaw or, or a vulnerability. So that's kind of the interfaces that exist. We have this IPC mechanism, you have the system calls, and then you have the file system. We'll talk a little bit about some of the security issues that kind of arose as I was looking through, through all this. 
So initially, this whole idea of a Pico process actually came from something called Project Astoria. And actually, it was something from more than a year ago. And it was supposed to be an Android runtime that lets you run Android applications on Windows 10 Mobile. And so all of this was not for Bash. It was so you can run, you know, Angry Birds or whatever wind, uh, Android app doesn't exist on a Windows phone. When this was in preview builds, the only way you can kind of play with this was actually either have a Windows phone, so the five people in the world who have that, or have the Windows mobile emulator. So when I did my initial research, it was against the Windows mobile emulator. However, when the final version came out, they just completely got rid of all of this code. So it just disappeared. There's no more Project Astoria, no more Android support. So that was kind of disappointing. In the anniversary of the previous though, which, you know, final build came out yesterday, they replaced this ADSS driver with an LXSS driver. And so Project Astoria was gone, and now they basically re, 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 re implemented the original Posix subsystem, right? Because Windows, from the beginning, could run uh, Linux applications. Just they had to re recompile this PE, and then they got rid of it and brought it back, and got rid of it and brought it back. So now it's back again, except it runs L files. And instead of running the Android AOSP, now it runs Ubuntu 14. And then they added a lot more support for desktop apps instead of just mobile apps, and they got rid of things, slash, things like the frame buffer or things like the Android debugging uh, bus, ADB, and they made it a Linux subsystem instead of, a, of an Android subsystem. And so when I first saw this on the Insider Preview, one of the interesting things was, for example, proxies were invisible in Task Manager. So you spawn up a bash prompt and, you know, uh, man or tail or less, and you wouldn't see nothing in Task Manager. In Process Hacker and Resmon, you would see them, but not Task Manager. The document, the kernel API that security vendors have, which gives them notifications that proxy are being created, you didn't get a notification for Pico proxy and Pico threats. They're basically invisible to you. The libraries and the processes that are being created and mapped, they're not mapped as sec image. They're not mapped as image section objects, so you don't actually get image load notification callbacks. So this bypasses app blocker when you launch a Linux app, for example. If you whitelist bash.exe or if you whitelist a, a, a bash launcher, you automatically whitelist any elf binary. And then any file access ending network access appears like it's coming from the kernel, right? Because LX core is actually doing the access. It will be pointing to the PID and the TID in user mode that's actually doing this, the actual Pico process, but the previous mode will be set to kernel. So you might trust this IO because it looks like it's coming from the kernel, unless you look deeper and you see that's coming from user mode. And there's an API that you know vendors can use to get the name of a Pico of a process. For a Pico process, this return null. So if you, want, if you somehow saw some malware doing something in a Linux environment, you wanted to get its name, you got back null. And then all this was hidden behind this developer mode and feature installation that basically said if you want to use any of these features, you have to be in developer mode. But the truth was that LX Core was installed by default. And LXS, man, LXSS Manager, which did the actual checks, well, it provided a COM interface, yes, which went through the checks, but the driver itself allowed any admin to talk to it. So basically, because LX Core was there by default, regardless of whether developer mode was on or not, anyone could just talk to the driver and create instances. So back in February, before this was even announced, I tweeted out this picture where I had this thing called PicoMe, a random Windows executable, without actually even having installed WSL because it didn't even exist. And there's, there was LX Core going ahead and launching a process and validating an ELF header. And that's when Microsoft reached out to me and said, stop tweeting about this. <clears throat> so, because they didn't want the first announcement for WSL to be, here's some random elf malware. Few other problems is that all the handles these Pico proxies create end up being kernel handles. So if you look at the handle table with any tools, you don't see anything. You could also inject Win32 threads in these Pico processes. You could change the context of the Pico process. You could modify the memory of a Pico process. So basically there was no layer of protection between a Windows app running as Alex and a Pico app running as Alex, even though they're very different things. And the weirdest thing was the ability to inject an NT thread inside of a Pico process. So the Pico threads were talking to the Linux kernel, the Windows threads were talking to the Windows kernel. And they had fun stuff where the Windows kernel allows you to map addresses below 64K if you're a Linux app for compatibility. The Windows kernel doesn't let you do that if you're a Windows app, because that's often used for null pointer exploitation. So I could use the Linux thread to map the memory I normally don't have access to as a Windows thread, then use the Windows thread to then launch an exploit that normally would be mitigated against. So that was an issue as well. And then finally, the fact that there's no PEB, no TEB, um, the whole thing is ELF. How much security software today 
is ready to like hash an L file and understand what an L file is and extract feature vectors from an L file and run indicators of compromise from an L file. Now if you have a Linux product, sure, but on Windows most products kind of don't, don't bring them with them. So this really made me think that, you know, this is, this is really dangerous if this ships out in this state. So I reached out to Microsoft and basically decided to help address some of these issues, give them some suggestions, bring them up ahead of time, so hopefully by today these issues would be past issues and not, and not current issues. So let's see to today. So today all these processes show up in task manager. SC locate process image name, <coughs> sorry, returns the name, so it doesn't return null anymore. The driver has a special ACL, which only allows protected processes to touch it, so you need to be signed by Microsoft to be able to talk to it. Developer mode is now correctly enforced. You see all the network IO and netstat. You see all the file IO and resource monitor. And you can no longer open a handle to a Pico process from a Windows process. Except for very limited writes, I can't inject memory, inject a thread, mess with a Pico process from a Windows process in any way. So pretty much everything that kind of went out <coughs> as the big issues, they fixed those. Yet, there are some things that remain by design. Right? The first thing that's, that's there to realize is that file handles are still going to be kernel handles. So if you have a Linux process that actually opens a uh, Windows file, you're, gonna, you're not going to see that in the handle table of the actual process. If you look at the handle tables of, you know, in, in Process Hacker of absolutely any Pico process at all, just to show you one here, it's completely empty, right? But this isn't really empty, it's actually accessing things, and fortunately it's accessing them as part of the kernel process. So I've got tail here, which has an index.html file opened. And look who apparently has index.html opened. It's the system process, right? Because it's actually a kernel handle, not a user mode handle. Now the IO, you would see that as being associated to the user mode process, but um, obviously the handle would be owned by someone else. And there's no symbols for any of this stuff. And again, it's all ELF, right? So if you have an AV software on Windows, how does it know about ELF files? You also have a big attack surface issue, right? 200 system, 216 more system calls, 800 kilobytes of additional attack surface, things that have full network access, now within firewall rules, yes. Things that have full disk access within token rules, yes. But basically, you know, you could write ran, ransom elsewhere, which basically runs us the user account, encrypts all your files, and then runs in an environment that most, you know, endpoint software is not going to be able to, um, to react to. And then BSODs have been found. I mean, think this thing crashed. There, were, uh, there was a null point of view reference. There was an invalid point of view reference at some point. And these things were not found by fuzzers or by security researchers. They were found by users trying to use the environment during a preview. So this thing was crashing during a preview build by people trying to use it. Who knows if people would actually try to fuzz it and, and look at it. So thankfully the IPC interfaces are locked down, but, you know, that might change in the future. So if you're writing endpoint software, if you're just a sysadmin, um, I'll finish with kind of some key things here, which is first of all, you don't get any notifications for these threads or these processes. Now there's an undocumented API that does give you those notifications, but it's not documented, so you're not supposed to use it. If you do use it, then you're going to know about the Pico processes. But they have no NTDLL, no PEB, no TEB, no shared user data, no API set, no PE file, so is your software going to be able to handle a process that has none of those things? especially because there's no API to tell you if something is or isn't a Pico process. So if you try to touch the PEB, you'll just crash unless you check if it's null or not. Because these things aren't DLLs, your image load notifications don't get any callbacks. So you don't get any callback for NTDLL, you don't get a callback from the executable, because these things are not portable executables. They're ELF files. So you can see in Process Hacker and forensically, like if I look at MAN in the modules, I can actually see all the SO files and the MAN executable itself but they're not mapped as images, they're mapped as data. So forensically you can see them as ELF files, basically, as memory mapped files, but you won't get any callbacks in your load image notification to tell you that they've been loaded. And if you have a file system mini filter or a network mini filter, you will get the, no the notifications for any file I.O. It will correctly point you to the Pico process that's doing this, but because you don't know it's a Pico process, because there's no API to know that, you might crash if you try to read its PEB or try to touch NTDL, so you kind of have to guard yourself and now realize there's these processes that don't have the normal data that it normally have. And on top of that, if you've been basically using um, like a correlation of knowing what PIDs you've created and what, what PIDs have been created and what TITs have been created, because you never got a notification that this process was created, you're not actually going to know what this process is. Right? You're going to look up, is this a real process or not? And if you track all creations, you would have never seen this process so you don't actually know that a creation happened. 
And I have a quick screenshot here from Process Monitor. Here's Process Monitor seeing me read the index.html file. So you can see it's very useful information about this process. And if I look at a stack of this index.html file, <coughs> it's just showing me Linux opening the file. Right? There's nothing in user mode here whatsoever. And even in the main process monitor UI, here's who created the file. An empty process with no, with no, with nothing associated with it. So this is not really great, right? This is pretty scary if the bad guys start using some of this, some of this stuff. So I'll skip all these and just conclude with basically saying that, you know, Microsoft, you have to appreciate, they took the time to basically fix all the issues I brought up. They addressed every single one of the main issues that were not kind of things that, that were done by implementation design. At the same time, they, they addressed all the user requests from people that wanted more and more features. They started blog posts, they started videos. So they've done a lot of good work to kind of demonstrate what the system is all about. But there's nothing for AV vendors. There's nothing for security vendors, right? The API to know about Pico processes is undocumented. There's no API to know if you have a Pico process that you're touching. And most security software probably is not aware that things can have a null PEB, that there might not be a shared user data, that there won't be a notification for NTDLL. So they might deadlock, they might assert, they might crash as they start encountering these Pico processes. And more importantly, how many vendors today have an ELF parser in their Windows binary, right? Who parses ELF files on Windows? Some AV companies do, but a lot of them, especially a lot of new startups and, and you know, cyber startups, they probably never assume they'd have to worry about ELF files on a Windows machine. So my worry is that they're gonna, you know, hack their way around, use undocumented structures, basically figure out a way to protect systems because there's no official guidance from anyone. So that, that really has to change, otherwise things, things are gonna be pretty dangerous in the, in the, in the Linux world. So with that being said, <coughs> I wanna thank a bunch of people, especially um, Angel Bertini, he is actually, he's the one who actually created this, uh, the really cool picture at the beginning. Um, so with a little evil Linux, uh, thing hiding inside, so thanks to Anj and thanks to everyone else who helped with this. Um, Microsoft blogs on the WSL talk about some of this stuff as well. There's a GitHub page where you can see all the issues that people have been submitting, and I will post on GitHub uh, videos of the demos as well as the source code that I used so you don't actually miss out on that. So you have my presentation slides um, and a video. I will publish that on my there, UNESCO 007 GitHub. You can email me, pretty easy to find online. So that's that. So thanks a lot, sorry I ran a little bit late. Hope you liked it. Um, if you have any questions, again, uh, there's a coffee break, so you can probably reach out to me after since I'm over time. But thank you very, very much, and enjoy Black Hat. Thank you. <clears throat>